Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rajendra Nayak. I work for Qualcomm. Uh, I've been part of the Linux kernel team at Qualcomm for close to about 10 years now, primarily focusing on getting support for our various different SOCs upstream. The most recent one that I've been uh, working on is the X Elite. So I'm here today to talk about our journey so far with uh, respect to adding support for it in Linux kernel. <coughs> so let's get started. Um, before I talk about the software and the, and the Linux status, I want to spend some time on the hardware itself. Um, this is our latest gen laptop SOC, which means that it's primarily targeted at a laptop form factor device. So uh, you won't see this in, for instance, Android phones. Uh, this chip was announced in October of last year. Uh, there are no devices out there yet in the market, uh, but uh, we'll see a lot of these devices come out in the next six months or so in the second half of 24. Uh, this is not the first generation of laptop SOC from Qualcomm. We've had uh, prior generations. I'll touch a little bit upon what's different here, uh, what to expect in terms of performance, how does it stack up against competitors or the incumbents in the, in the laptop space today. Uh, then I'll talk about the, the work we've been doing over the last six months or so to get support for this merged in mainline. We're kind of halfway there. There's still uh, a lot more things that we need to get uh, merged in mainline, so I'll talk about what, what our next focus areas is over the next few months so that uh, we make sure that this chip is well supported and, and upstream kernel. Uh, and then at the end of it, I wanted to uh, show a quick demo with this, uh, with this device here that we have been largely using as our test platform. It's not a commercially available uh, laptop. It's... Uh, it's uh, a test device at, at, at Qualcomm, which we call as a compute reference device. The support for this is already upstream. This is booted up with Debian with an almost mainline 6.9 RC kernel. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get the external display working on this in time for me to kind of connect this to the projector and show a little demo uh, out here at the end. But uh, we do have a, a demo booth that our uh, partners, Lenaro, have put up at the demo area. So this device is going to be available there for anybody to uh, take a look uh, in, the, in the demo booth. So like I said, this is not the first uh, uh, chip from Qualcomm, which has gone into the laptops, uh, uh, laptop space. We've had uh, these devices for a few years now. Uh, some of them have had good Linux support uh, in, uh, uh, in mainline. Uh, some of these notable ones are the Lenovo devices. The uh, C630, which came out back in 2019, I think, which was based on the Snapdragon 850, uh, followed by the Flex 5G, which was based on HCX Gen 1, and then the, the last year's Snapdragon X13S, which was based on HCX Gen 3. So all of these had good Linux support, uh, thanks to the AR64 laptop project, which was uh, a collaboration between uh, uh, Lenovo, ARM, uh, Lenaro, and, and Qualcomm. So coming to 24, what's different? Uh, from a hardware point of view, the big difference is the CPU itself. There are other differences in other IPs. Uh, but the CPU is a custom CPU that's done by Qualcomm. This is the first generation of, uh, of the custom CPU, which we call as Orion. Uh, and this is the first chip to have this, uh, this chip in it, uh, this uh, CPU in it. So the X Elite uh, comes with uh, 12 identical Orion cores. Um, these are um, split into three clusters of four CPUs each. Uh, they can go all the way up to 3.8 gigahertz. Um, they support single and dual core boost of uh, up to 4.3 gigahertz, which means that if, if you have just one CPU active in the, in the cluster or one CPU in each of the clusters, two clusters active, it can go all the way up to 4.3 uh, gigahertz. Uh, it's got a quite a capable uh, GPU, Adreno GPU, which can do up to 4.6 teraflops. NPU for AI use cases, which can do up to 45 tops. Uh, standard LPDDR5X memory, uh, all the way up to 64 GB, 16-bit 16, 16 8-channel. Uh, standard storage options for uh, SD, NVMe, as well as uh, UFS. Uh, this one out here has uh, NVMe, SSD, or PCIe. Um, Display primary interfaces supported are DP and EDP. And uh, for video, we have a new video decode block, 
which can uh, do a whole bunch of encode decode options, including uh, the AB1 encode, which is new. And then we have standard camera ISP solution, uh, uh, standard uh, Qualcomm audio solution, and then the cellular modem and the Wi-Fi uh, is over external PCIe with an M.2 card. So I wanted to uh, show a few performance benchmarks here for CPU, GPU, and so on to kind of give you an idea of how these compare uh, against competitors, how this compares against our previous generations, and so on. But there have been at least a few queues of these uh, which are clocked at different frequencies, uh, devices which have different thermal uh, um, uh, envelopes. So there are a few different benchmarks available. So I didn't want to put something which is not completely accurate or is misleading, so I did not put any benchmark numbers, but you can always go and search for Snapdragon X Elite Geekbench uh, 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 Geekbench benchmarks or, or uh, some of the others like Cinebench, and you'll see a lot of uh, data already, which is uploaded in the public domain. So instead, I uh, just copied some of the, okay, uh, some of the press that's been uh, around these devices off late. Uh, just to give you an idea of what to expect from these devices in terms of performance. Uh, so in short, these are quite uh, capable, this is quite capable SOC for a laptop space, uh, both from a CPU, GPU, as well as from AI workload point of view. So moving on to software. Uh, so we've had this tradition at Qualcomm for a few years now that we post patches out for at least our flagship SOCs fairly early once the device is, uh, uh, once the chip gets announced, within a day or two. So you can see that the uh, Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, all of these had uh, patches posted out within a day or two of, uh, of the chip being officially announced. We wanted to do the exact same thing from, for Snapdragon X Elite. So we, uh, we, there was a lot of work that was done to get uh, Linux booted up on these devices um, and patches ready for posting them for uh, for mainline post. The the one big difference here is that the the top three chips that you see are all targeted at Android phones. So we had active Linux programs inside of Qualcomm to get Linux up and running with Android, uh, whereas the Snapdragon X Elite is primarily targeted at Windows laptop market space. But we still wanted to make sure that we have Linux support for these. And uh, we, we are putting efforts to get it merged in mainline. In terms of uh, boot firmware on these, on, on these devices, it's standard UEFI boot. Um, uh, it's, uh, Linux boots up using device trees. Um, it supports standard bootloaders like Grub and uh, System D boot. This one here is booting uh, Debian using Grub. Um, DT selection is one of the open issues that we have at this point, which is basically how does the bootloader know which device is booting on when there are more than one device tree blobs uh, packaged together in one software package, which is quite common for OEMs who come up with different kind of slightly different SKUs but want to flash one single uh, software package onto these devices. Um, there's, we have a few ways of doing this in the, in the Android world, and uh, my colleague Elliot has a talk tomorrow, I think at 4.55, to talk about this specific problem and what we are proposing to kind of solve this in, uh, in um, upstream. This is a very high level uh, boot flow diagram of how the device boots. So there's the primary bootloader booting out of uh, uh, ROM, which loads the secondary bootloader into internal memory, uh, which then initializes the DDR and loads the uh, Qualcomm Gunia hypervisor, and that runs in EL2. And then we have uh, a UEFI running in non-secure EL1, and then um, UEFI then loads Grub from the EFI system partition, and Grub then figures out where to find the kernel and uh, 
and in a drama first and all of this from the grub.cfg. In terms of kernel uh, upstream status, uh, we started off posting patches for these chips quite late into 6.7, so there was very little that got merged in 6.7, but we followed it up with 6.8, 6.9. So in the last couple of releases, there's been a decent amount of support that's already merged. We have uh, pretty much all the infrastructure pieces around clock, spin control, um, power domains, interconnect, all of these merged. There's uh, SMMU support, system cache. Uh, both the uh, reference devices that we use for our development, which is this, the CRD and another device, the QCP, both of these have support upstream. We have all the multimedia clocks merged a bunch of fire drivers and uh, the primary storage interface on these, which is NVMe or PCIe. Uh, we also have uh, the DSPs being brought out of reset um, and uh, the firmware, firmware loaded on, on these for uh, some of the audio use cases. But this is, like I said, it's, it's like uh, we are halfway there in terms of of having full Linux support for these. There's quite a lot of things that is missing, and that's primarily our focus going forward over the next few merge windows to get all of this support merged in, uh, in mainline. Uh, so top of our list is uh, primary display, which is uh, over uh, EDP, and then uh, some of the power management things like getting the dynamic scaling working with CPU freq and memory uh, DCPS, DCPS, stands for dynamic clock and voltage scaling. Uh, that's primarily the technique we use to scale the, the DDR as well as the caches. Um, and then uh, the low power modes through suspend resume, system-wide suspend resume, and then camera and video are the big uh, missing pieces for now. A little bit more detailed into the status uh, for display. There's been some rework that's been happening for the way the EDP and DP support today exists. The way it's been uh, done today is to use two different compatible strings to distinguish between uh, DP and EDP uh, interfaces. But these are, at the end of the day, the same controller and the same file, so uh, that was obviously not the right way to do it. So there's work happening to clean this thing up in upstream. Uh, so once this, uh, some of this work gets merged, there should be DP and EDP support for uh, X1 Elite merged as well. The main MDSS driver, which controls all of these uh, panel interfaces, support for that is already merged. Uh, sorry, support for that is already posted out. It's not merged yet. Uh, but once all of these patches that I've listed here get merged in mainline, we should have primary display working on uh, interface working on, on these devices. Uh, for the uh, external DP, though, we, we are still uh, getting things working. Uh, it needs uh, a retimer driver to be written and upstreamed, uh, so that's still uh, uh, in, in the works. So we have it working with some monitors, but uh, we're still trying to figure out uh, how to make it work in, in all cases. In terms of GPU status, uh, I think A740 is already merged. A750 patches are on the list. Uh, Neil has been pushing those uh, to get them merged uh, upstream. The, the GPU in this particular SOC is a slightly different variant of these. So there are incremental patches we have in our tree for now, which are not posted out yet, but we plan to get those posted and merged uh, in upstream um, for the kernel as well as MESA. And then uh, the, the firmware is not there in Linux firmware yet, but that's also something that we're working on to get the necessary uh, permissions to get the, the GPU firmware merged in Linux firmware. In terms of video, uh, there's a new uh, VPU block video processing unit, as we call it. It's a new generation of the IP as compared to the previous generation. Um, the previous generation one was called Venus. This one's called Iris. So there was a new driver for Iris that was posted out in July of last year, uh, but it was a completely new driver, not taking into account whatever uh, that uh, already existed. So, uh, so it was obviously uh, not the right way to do it. So there was effort done to kind of merge 
uh, these two drivers together and have support for Iris added on top of the Venus driver. But then the way the, the Venus driver is structured, it was really hard to get these new uh, uh, functionality and new uh, interfaces merged on the old driver. So for now, the plan is to write a completely new driver, but which also supports the, the older generation IP. So we'll have one driver, which is written from scratch, which supports Iris and Venus, and then over a period of time, deprecate the, the older driver for the older IP. Uh, it supports uh, a bunch of these encode decode uh, options, including VP9 uh, decode. Audio is fairly well supported upstream. Uh, the uh, uh, WCD uh, codex, as well as the WSA sample uh, uh, speaker amplifiers, were already upstream because they are views from the previous generation. Um, and then we, we had sound card and the mic support already merged upstream. So, so speakers, the audio speakers on these devices, for instance, and the audio jack headset, everything works out of the box with the mainline uh, kernel. There was also some, uh, uh, some things that had to be merged for the, for, uh, for the sound wire interface because we had multiple speakers on one single sound wire interface. We have two sound, sound wire controllers with four speakers on these. So those patches are, I think, pulled in as well. The only pending thing on audio at this point is uh, support for analog mic. Camera, uh, we have most of the infrastructure pieces already uh, merged, uh, clocks, regulators, and uh, the PMIC support, everything that's needed to get the sensors powered up and so on. There's still work ongoing to get the cam assess driver uh, for, uh, for this chip up and running, which is basically bringing up all these interfaces for CSI Phi, CSID, and the BFE RDI interface. So once this is up, um, the plan is to get the same lip camera soft ISP solution working on these devices that we've, we have working on the previous generations, uh, which should enable uh, us to do uh, Google Hangout and uh, Zoom calls kind of uh, uh, use cases with uh, PipeWire enabled Firefox. Uh, for, for anybody who wants to know more about the lip camera soft ISP solution, there's a talk tomorrow by Brian from uh, Lenaro, uh, who's going to talk about all the work he's been doing to, uh, to enable this uh, lip camera stack, uh, soft ISP stack. In terms of power management, uh, most of the active power management, which is the CPU scaling as well as the bus scaling pieces are out on the list. Um, so the scaling on this SOC is done uh, in a uh, in a coprocessor, which is um, the, the firmware supports the SEMI interface. So for CPU FREC, we are using the standard uh, SEMI-based CPU FREC driver upstream. Uh, we also have a mailbox driver to communicate with the coprocessor, which is already posted out. Um, there were certain things missing in the upstream SEMI CPU FREC driver like the boost frequency support and the limit notifier support for uh, thermal uh, notifiers that can come in to, to tell the kernel that certain frequencies are not available. Uh, all of that is, is, uh, uh, is either on the list or merged. For the bus scaling part, we, we have the same firmware supporting um, an SEMI vendor protocol, and we're trying to get the vendor protocol merged uh, upstream, this is the first SEMI vendor protocol that that's be, that's getting merged in upstream kernel. So it's taking a little while to uh, to sort things out and and get it merged. But the patches are out on the list, and this should enable us to uh, enable the the scaling features for uh, DDR as well as for our uh, caches. In terms of low power modes, uh, suspend to idle is already supported. We have support for CPU idle. Uh, while using suspend to idle to get into low power modes, which is system wide low power mode suspend resume. Uh, we do have a few uh, drivers which are misbehaving, which we need to, uh, which we are yet to fix. And then we are still not hitting the lowest power mode uh, on, on these devices, which means that we need to go look at some of the warts which are not being released from some of these drivers so that we can, we can hit the lowest power states. But that's something that we are, uh, we are actively working on. 
In terms of distro status, um, not much. We've been mostly playing around with Debian on these devices. Uh, so there's an experimental installer that's uh, available openly, but it can only be used on these uh, test devices for now. So in short, the roadmap for us for the next six months is to primarily get video decode fully functional in the kernel with an upstream driver. Um, and not only that, uh, but to get it working end to end with browsers like Firefox and Chrome so that when you open YouTube and you're playing a video, if it's, uh, for instance, a VP9 video that you're playing, it uses the underneath uh, video decoder uh, to uh, decode the frames. Enable camera in the kernel and uh, also enable the lip camera software SP solution that's already working on previous generation uh, devices. And uh, this solution should be a lot more usable on these devices given, uh, given the more powerful CPUs we have on these. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, GPU, CPU optimizations in our internal tree, which we are yet to clean up, get it merged uh, upstream. Uh, so these, um, these optimizations are currently not in a state where it's very generic to get uh, things merged upstream, but we're working on getting them cleaned up and done in the, the right way so that we can get the best performance out of our GPUs and CPUs on these uh, chip. Um, and then power optimizations for uh, the, the dynamic scaling as well as the system-wide suspend resume uh, use cases. Uh, the goal is to get uh, all firmware and Linux firmware as soon as possible. We're still working with, uh, with the right people to get the, uh, get the clearances to get all these things merged in Linux firmware. And then finally, uh, we are obviously open to working with OEMs when these devices launch and they come out and with distro vendors who want uh, you know, to, to work with us and uh, get some easy installers for people to, to get uh, the distros working on, Linux distros working on, on, on these uh, end devices when they, when they are launched. Uh, in terms of the hardware that, that I have here, this is, uh, like I said, the, the primary development platform that we've been using it's called the Compute Reference Device. Um, it's got the primary display on EDP. It's an AMOLED 14.5 inch. It's got a third party touch support. Uh, it's got three USB type C ports, which all uh, have uh, DP alt mode support. So you can use them for external uh, DP. Uh, both WLAN and 5G modem uh, on this are on uh, external PCIe M.2 cards. And then it has a LPDDR5 16 GB of memory uh, these chips can support all the way up to 64 GB. It's got Spinar based boot, and then the primary storage is uh, NVMe over PCIe. And then there are four of these uh, speaker amplifiers, the Codex and uh, D mics. Uh, in terms of the software setup that we have on these devices, it's running uh, Debian 12 SID. Uh, and like I said, it's running an almost mainline 6.9 RC kernel. I wanted to give some more details on what almost mainline means. Uh, so we don't have a whole lot of patches on top of 6.9 RC to get this device uh, to this current state. We have just 105 patches. Of these, about 78 are already on the list, which means they're posted. They are being uh, uh, discussed for uh, getting them merged in mainline. And there are only 27 of them that we are yet to post out because, like I said, there are some of these are fixes, hacks that we are yet to clean up and get it in a state where we can post it uh, upstream. So the link there is the link to the public tree that we've been uh, using. All, all this code that's running on this is, is publicly available. Uh, this has GPU hardware rendering enabled as well as hardware video decode enabled, but this is uh, using the, the video decode driver that's been out on the list. Uh, but that's not the driver that's going to get merged, so it's going to get reworked. So I think that's all I had. Just a quick question regarding like the Windows equivalent software. Like, um, where is that standing? Is it about the same, like, kind of half-baked 
or is that further along? I was just curious. Uh, you're talking about uh, the applications and some of those which are natively x86 and then are they ported over on ARM? Is that the question? No, uh, more like driver support. So like, for example, let's take the video pipeline or whatever, right? Uh -huh. is, or maybe your display port. Is that right. already working in Windows? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So all of that is working in Windows. The, the devices are gonna get launched with Windows on them mm -hmm. in the coming months. So Windows is like the primary OS which is gonna enable these devices. But uh, we're working to make sure that Linux is well supported as well on all these chips which are targeted at Windows uh, laptop market so that anybody wanting to boot uh, a Linux Destro should be able to do that fairly easily if we have all the platform support merged in, in mainline, right? It'll still take some work. Like I said, we'll have to work with OEMs and with distro vendors so that uh, you know folks don't have to do a whole lot of jumping through hoops to get this uh, working and that are easy to use installers and whatnot. But that's something uh, that we are open to work with uh, as, as these devices launch. So some OEMs are more open than some others and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm here um, on, not quite on, ooh, I'm not on behalf of Seagate, but I work for Seagate. We're a, a hardware vendor. We sell hard drives. So I'm asking for some perspective because we don't have a whole lot of dedicated staff um, for patches to the kernel. We work on a lot of older stuff, SCSI mostly. Um, so what's the distribution kind of of work for these patches? Do you have a lot of, of full-time engineers on this or is it, you know, are you working with like Lenaro or, or other companies? Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how that works? Sure. So for now, uh, it's not a very big team. Uh, you can say maybe a max of 10 engineers across Qualcomm and Lenaro, uh, or maybe even less than that. That's the kind of uh, folks that have been working on to get this to this level. Um, but yeah, depending on uh, the interest and uh, like I said, as the devices get launched, if there are OEMs who are interested and, and so on, then maybe there's gonna be a lot more people working. But at this point, it's it's not a whole lot of people. It's a, it's a very small team that's enabling this, yeah. That's uh, more than we got, so that's yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I think uh, you can pass it on there, back, back over there. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I saw one slide where you mentioned you are using Debian uh, with yeah. 6.9 RCs. Yes. And uh, so for the end product, are you carrying some patches for boot time optimization or like which bootloader you are using or Falcon boot or something? No, so uh, there is no end product at this point. So this is mostly us trying to use Debian as a way to, you know, um, get the kernel things validated and merged in mainline kernel. So our primary focus is to get support for these SOCs in mainline, right? And then if there's an end product where um, we want to uh, use Debian as OS, that's when some of these optimizations and boot optimizations and all those sort of things is, is gonna come in. At this point, our primary focus is to try and get base support for these SOCs mainline so that everything in the kernel space is is uh, in mainline kernel.org. Thank you. So, yeah. So did you actually find something you thought would be easy turned out to be a lot harder than you thought doing this? 
Uh, I didn't get that. Can you repeat? Uh, did, when you were doing all this work, did, was there something you thought w would be easy to do would, that, turn, would, that ended up actually being a lot harder? Um, no, not really. Uh, I mean, we've, we've done this before. We've done, um, we've, we've been, like I said, uh, getting support merged for upstream for our flagship devices for a while now. So it was not the first time that we were working with upstream kernel community to get these uh, things merged. There were obviously things we were doing for the first time on this particular chipset. For example, I, I spoke about the the SEMI thing, the vendor protocol. Uh, that's the first time we're doing this on, um, on this chip. So some of these things which our first time for this SOC have been slightly more harder to get it merged upstream. Then, for instance, getting all the base support for clocks and regulators and whatnot, right? So, so there's already good support for those for our platforms upstream. So it was just a matter of adding this additional SOC support in those, those drivers. So only for the things which are fairly new and uh, first time on this SOC, that's the only thing that's been uh, taking a slightly more time. And one yeah. last question. So you said you, you, you produce your own ARM-compatible CPU core. Yeah. Did that provide any problems with upstream? No, that was uh, ARMv8 compliant, so there was absolutely no problem. It just, the kernel did not even need a single line of code change. It just put it up because it, it uh, complies to the V8 uh, spec. Okay, I guess if there's no other question, we'll uh, wrap it up. Thank you so much.